WDBM East Lansing. Welcome to The Sci-Files, an Impact 89 FM series focusing on student research here at Michigan State University. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. Hey, Danny, have you ever had smoked whitefish? Ooh, yeah, no, I remember actually going to Traverse City and trying one of their whitefish sandwiches up there. Yeah, Lake Whitefish is pretty good. They're actually native to the Great Lakes area over here. And today we're here with Courtney Harrison to tell us more about them. Courtney, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you for having me. So my name is Courtney Harrison. I'm a second year master's student in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State University. And my research focuses on investigating the effects of infectious diseases of Lake Whitefish and their subsequent recruitment to the Great Lakes. Is it possible that these infectious diseases can also have an effect on people? The diseases that I'm studying in particular do not. So they are not zoonotic, meaning that they cannot, meaning that if they infect the fish, a human cannot become infected from these same diseases. Even if they eat the fish? Even if they eat the fish, they will not be infected by these diseases. And what types of infectious diseases are you studying anyways? So I'm studying three bacterial diseases and one viral disease. The bacterial diseases are Rhenibacterium salmoninarum, which is the causative agent of bacterial kidney disease. Another one is Aramonas salmonicida, subspecies salmonicida, and it is the causative agent of furunculosis. And the third bacterial pathogen I'm studying is Carnobacterium species, which causes pseudokidney disease. You're studying these three bacteria and this viral disease, but what do all of these four pathogens have in common with each other anyways? So the four diseases that I'm studying are all found to be vertically transmitted from infected parent to offspring in other salmonid species. So that's other species that are not the lake whitefish. But interestingly, all four of these pathogens have been recovered from lake whitefish. In specific, adult lake whitefish in the Great Lakes, so Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. You mentioned that these pathogens are vertically transmitted, which means that it's going from the parents to the offspring. How are you proving that it's vertically transmitted? So my project in specific is the first of its kind. So there hasn't been any any previous research that has looked at the transmission pathway from an infected parent to its offspring in Lake Whitefish, so Corrigonus clupeiformis, which is the scientific name of the species. I'll show how the pathogen is transmitted from the infected parent to its offspring is by laboratory challenges, and I'll determine the median lethal dose, which means the concentration of the pathogen that can cause mortality or essentially kill 50% of the population of the lake whitefish used in these challenges. That's interesting. I actually got the opportunity to learn about what these lethal doses meant when I took a pharmacology course back in my undergraduate. But how do you measure the median lethal dose of these whitefish populations with this bacteria? So I'll infect the lake whitefish used in the laboratory experimental challenges with a range of concentrations of the bacteria from low, medium, to high. I'll do this three times each for um, each of the pathogens that we talked about earlier. So I'll monitor the fish daily for a certain amount of time, typically 28 to 30 days. And I'll record mortalities from each tank, and I'll collect the dead fish from each tank, and I'll inspect the fish to confirm the presence of the bacterium used in the challenge, and then I'll analyze the tissue to see what changes that bacterium caused in the fish. Referring to earlier in the episode, you mentioned that you were looking at vertical transmission from parent to offspring that are transmitting these pathogens. So whenever you're analyzing the concentration of the pathogens that are being applied, are all your fish the same age? Are they all adult whitefish? Or are you varying the ages of them? Like, are you looking at younger whitefish versus older whitefish as well? For my laboratory experimental challenges, I'll be looking at juvenile lake whitefish, so age zero fish, which essentially means fish below the age of one year. But how does this show if the bacteria is following a vertical transmission, if it's being introduced when the fish are juvenile? 
So for my project, like I said, I'm looking at vertical transmission from infected parent to offspring. So to do that, I'll actually have to go out into wild populations and sample from adult like whitefish. So I have two field seasons. The first field season is in the fall. I'll go out to lakes Superior, Michigan, and Huron and collect uh, adult lake whitefish. And I'll bring them back to the laboratory I work in, the Michigan State University Aquatic Animal Health Laboratory. I'll euthanize the fish using a chemical compound called MS222. So once the fish are dead, I'll look at the outside of the fish for any parasites that are living like on or within the skin, on the gills. I'll look at the eyes, too. I'll take samples, too, to look under the microscope for the pathogens or the parasites that I you know, can't see with the naked eye. I'll then look at the inside of the fish and look at every individual tissue to look for any notable changes in the tissue. You're looking at a variety of pathogens, so I'm wondering, can you just tell the difference with them just by looking at them under the microscope, or do you need to stain them as well? And what other techniques are you using in the lab? Fortunately, with the pathogens I'm looking at, I don't necessarily have to do anything different to look at these pathogens while I'm looking at the fish in front of me. But once that I've collected all the tissues that I can from the fish, there are additional laboratory tests and different tests that I'll run on the same sample to determine whether or not I'm looking at pathogen A or pathogen B. So because I'm studying a variety of pathogens, there are different tests that I'll use in the laboratory to one, confirm the presence of the pathogen in the fish, and two, confirm the identity of that pathogen. So for, for bacteria, I'll actually grow the bacteria in our lab. Same method for the virus I'm studying. I'll actually infect the, t the samples that I collect from the fish and infect um, cells and see if that virus will grow in the lab. You're studying these different infectious diseases and how they affect the lake whitefish, but I'm sure there's a lot of people in our audience wondering why this is important for the Great Lakes Society. Do you elaborate a little bit more on what this impact has on whitefish populations? Recently, we've been seeing a decline in lake whitefish, not only the, their growth and just the amount of lake whitefish in the lakes, but we've also seen a decrease in their recruitment to the Great Lakes. So we're seeing uh, far less new fish introduced to these populations, especially in the early life stages, so um, the eggs and the fry. And so we know that infectious diseases has been a problem in the Great Lakes in the past. So a great example of that is the declines in Chinook salmon back in the 1980s to early 1990s, which Rennibacterium salmoninarum was one of the factors of those declines. So Chinook salmon were just washing up dead on the shores of Lake Michigan. My hypothesis is, are these infectious diseases negatively affecting Great Lakes Lake Whitefish recruitment? Could the population just be going down because more people are fishing for them? That could be a reason. Previous studies have also looked at climate change and changes in the Great Lakes food web, but no one has looked at whether or not infectious diseases could also be a contributing factor to these declines. So we don't know the answer to that. We don't have a conclusive, yes, this is the reason why we're seeing less like whitefish, but it could be a reason. You mentioned earlier that you go to the different Great Lakes to get your whitefish around the fall time. What is that experience like? So I work with a few commercial fishermen, and they let me come out on their boats, and we'll go out and collect like whitefish. So at each selected field location for my project, we actually visit a few nets. So it's not just one population or not just one, you know, unit of lake whitefish. We'll go to several in the same area. This also helps my project too to get a variety of male to female ratio. I'll also select lake whitefish in a range of sizes too. The, all of these different field excursions that you took throughout your graduate degree, what was the one that was the most memorable to you? The most memorable experience was from this past fall season. I traveled to Whitefish Bay in Lake Superior for one of my field sites. 
and it was super cold and it started snowing halfway you know through collecting the lake whitefish and um, the water was a little choppy too but when the lake whitefish are there they're there and you need to go out and collect them so it wasn't like deadliest catch but it was definitely a fun uh, experience I'd imagine the water is still really cold like no matter what time of the year it is it is very cold and the tricky part, too, about my project is I want to keep my fish alive. So from when I collect them in the fall, I want to keep them alive until I bring them back to my laboratory. So keeping the temperature consistent with, you know, what the fish are used to in the lake and then during transport is always tricky, but we manage to do it. Do you have a specific vehicle that you use to transport them, or do you just put them, like, in the back of your trunk? So my lab actually works pretty closely with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, and we were fortunate to borrow one of their trailers that has a live well attached to it. So it, it has enough room for all the fish that I collected, enough water for them to survive transportation, and enough air. So oxygen that is supplied to the tanks. That sounded like it was an incredible experience checking out that uh, fall season, but what happens in the spring season by any chance? So in the spring is when I'll collect the juvenile lake whitefish. So that's when they're out in the sandy beaches of the lakes. So I'll, I'll take a huge net. It's called a beach seine. And I'll stand on the beach. I'll have one person on the shore and another person walk out into the lake as far as they can go. And we'll make a U shape. We'll bring the net back onto the shore. And that's how we collect the juveniles. And we'll do the same thing. So we'll keep them in aerated buckets or coolers and bring them back to our laboratory. As the last question for this interview, I wanted to understand what motivated you to pursue this research in the first place. I'm originally from West Virginia, so growing up, I spent a lot of time outdoors. But what's particularly interesting about my research is that I also get to have some fun. So, like I mentioned, I get in the fall, I get to go out onto commercial fishing boats and fish for the adult lake whitefish. And in the spring, I'm on the beaches, beach seining and collecting lake whitefish. So not only do I get to study, you know, a passion of mine, which is infectious disease, but I'm also out in the field working closely with the live fish. Well, thank you for joining us today, Courtney, and good luck in your future laboratory challenges to find that connection in the vertical transmission of these different pathogens you're studying. It was a pleasure meeting both of you. The Sci-Files is hosted by Chelsea Voodoo and Daniel Puentes for Impact 89FM. Thank you to our news director, Sophie Sagan, program director, Amber Konutsky, station manager, Joe Dandron, and general manager, Jeremy Whiting. This show, as well as the entire Impact 89FM podcast lineup, can be found online at impact89fm.org or by searching for The Sci-Files on your favorite podcast directory. If you're an MSU student and want to be featured on The Sci-Files, or if you have any questions, you can contact us at sci-files at impact89fm.org. See you next week on Sci-Files. Thanks for listening, and remember, the truth is in the science.